Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, in New York City. I want to start off this week by thanking you guys for the positive feedback on last week's episode featuring my friend and yours, David Tuckman, who came on and talked about his main event as well as some other topics, including sports betting and life in general. Uh, so if you haven't checked out that episode, I would highly recommend that you do so. Tuck is a professional broadcaster. He's the voice of the World Series of Poker. And I feel that he approaches the game and the job with a great amount of expertise, as well as a pretty good sense of humor, too. I always laugh anytime I get a chance to talk with the great David Tuckman. So check out last week's episode to hear for yourself. Uh, this week, a lot is going on in poker. It seems like summer's over and now everybody's uh, making news. The Wire Act, it's official. The Wire Act does not apply to online poker and it's official. That's the final, final word on what has now been a 10 plus year legal battle. Guys, Black Friday here in the U.S. was April 15th, 2011. So that's a long freaking time ago. And some of you will remember we were all happily playing on Poker Stars and on Party Poker and other sites. And then one day it just all came to an end when the federal government here in the United States decided to ban online poker in the supposed land of the free. Now, because our government is so completely inept, many, many sites remained in business and basically Full Tilt Poker and Poker Stars were the two that got shut down first. Uh, meanwhile, there were sites like Lock Poker and many others that continue to operate what is now Ignition Poker and so many others, Bovada, continued to operate as they still do today, despite this supposed full force crackdown. Well, part of that was that they were referring to a, a, an old law from the 60s called the Wire Act, which banned certain types of transactions related to sports betting. A company called International Gaming Technology, IGT. You've probably seen IGT if you've ever played video poker or probably at least 30 or 40 percent of all the slot machines in all the casinos around the world. They're manufactured by IGT and they also run lottery systems in several states that have games like Keno as part of their lottery. So it was very important for IGT to get clarity on whether or not the Wire Act and the rulings around it would ever spread to other games besides sports betting. Uh, there's a lot of money invested in these lottery programs and, of course, online poker. And up to this point, there was an uncomfortable amount of ambiguity around the Department of Justice's authority to crack down on those types of businesses in the same way it can be used to crack down on illegal sports betting. So obviously there is so much outdated stuff going on here. Um, we don't even use wires in that way anymore. Uh, sports betting is legal in more than 50% of the states in the union. This is a huge win for online poker in America. Legal, licensed, regulated, insured, guaranteed online poker without fear of another, essentially what would amount to another Black Friday. So a lot of people are viewing this as a huge win for online poker going forward. It could convince more states to allow online poker. It could also encourage states that already have legal online poker to combine player pools across states, as we've seen with uh, Nevada, New Jersey, Michigan, and others kind of joining together. So maybe eventually we'll have shared liquidity among the states that 
would almost certainly result in much larger prize pools, bigger guarantees, and just more fun for those who have access to legal online poker in the United States. So this is a big win. It's been a long time coming, but when it comes to government, nothing happens quickly, better late than never. And I'm hoping this will start a trend and maybe online poker will finally catch fire the way sports betting has. So it's good news. Uh, I always want to be a little bit cautious in my optimism, but this is definitely the ruling that the online poker community wanted all along. All right, well, let's talk about Ebony Kenny. I know she's a polarizing figure and probably many of you listening to this are not fans of hers, but let me start off right off the bat here. I like her. I know her personally. I'm not like her best friend or anything, but you know, we've definitely had some conversations over the years. Uh, she's a good person, someone I have always liked. She approaches the game with a lot of positivity. She feels like she has a platform and she wants to use it to help women in poker, but even just general positivity. You know, she likes to try to keep a smile on her face. And if you've ever watched her stream on Twitch, you know that Ebony Kenny's purpose in life is, seems to be to spread joy, love, happiness, and sexual freedom in all of its many forms. I mean, yeah, I know that she's a big personality. She's got some polarizing viewpoints that she shares from time to time, but I, for one, really like her. It's unequivocal that she's good for the game. And she recently, she's an ACR sponsored pro and the CEO of ACR is Phil Nagy. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing his name or not, but he sent her to Cyprus to play in a big Triton event there. And she had some success, even though she had never played in these high roller type of tournaments before. One of them was a $200,000 buy-in called the Coin Rivet. And she, she took fifth place for $1.7 million. Now, because Phil paid her buy-in, uh, a lot of people are speculating how much of that $1.7 million Ebony actually gets to keep. What was the staking deal? Does she have makeup? Like all this kind of stuff. That's none of your business. That's none of my business. And I don't really care. I, you might notice whenever I have poker guests on the podcast, I never ask them about their staking agreements. I don't really think that it's a polite question to ask someone who just won $1.7 million uh, how much of yourself did you have? Uh, however, Joey Ingram, who I'm sure most of you know, he is a YouTuber. He's also a poker player, something of a media personality. And he invited Ebony to go on his YouTube channel, podcast, whatever, and ostensibly celebrate her win. Joey asked a few pointed questions of his own. Uh, Phil Nagy maybe has his own background with regard to sexual misconduct or accusations. And so Joey brought that up, whether the fact that she's a woman has anything to do with her being sponsored by ACR and on and on and on. I think that Joey wanted to kind of ask the hard hitting questions, as it were. And I think that it kind of took her off guard, making matters worse. Joey seemed a bit distracted at points during the interview when Ebony was trying to answer his questions. And rather than listening to those answers, he was reading the chat. And if you've ever read the chat or the comments on any video, you usually regret doing so. And so there was obviously some toxic masculinity, if you will, in the chat box. And Ebony took exception to some of the comments being made. Somebody said at some point, during the conversation about women in poker. And if you'll pardon my language, but I'm quoting here, someone said, women need to stop being bitches to each other and fighting all the time. Turns out that the person who said that was actually a moderator. Also, when Ebony took exception to the comment, uh, the moderator immediately deleted the post and just simply commented one word, sorry. The moderator, as it turns out, is Donna Morton, a female. So as Ebony was upset because she thought that there was sexism in the chat, a man saying, hey, bitches shouldn't do this or whatever, uh, it turns out it was actually a woman writing that. 
And what I think we have here is a case of emotions flaring up a, a lot, a, sort of a lot in the cauldron, if you will, between the fact that Ebony must be on this huge emotional high. I think that she also took exception to the turn that Joey's questions to her in that interview took. I think she was not expecting sort of these uh, bigger questions about women in poker. And I don't think that she was aware that he was going to kind of bring up the uh, history of the ACR CEO, etc. So I think she may have been a bit surprised by that. Now, I have a friend. She's a comedian named Jamie Lee. Uh, she doesn't do as much stand up as she used to because she is now one of the writers on this really successful TV show on Apple TV called Ted Lasso. And Jamie told me many years ago when we used to write comedy together, she said, listen, Clayton, whatever you do in this world, don't read the comments. So yeah, just do the interview, Ebony. Don't read the comments in the chat because people are uh, very brave when they're hiding behind their keyboards. So I think we have a few things to talk about here. Number one, I want to be very clear what I think about women in poker. I think it is very important that the women in poker are treated well. No one should feel sexually harassed at the poker table. No one should feel intimidated by the fact that she is joining a world in which the vast majority of inhabitants are male. That should not be a source of stress for a woman who wants to try poker. Anytime women find themselves in the extreme minority, as they are both in poker and in comedy, a few things tend to happen. And I see this in both arenas. They tend to bond with each other. Like all the women in poker seem to know each other and root for each other. And maybe they can be catty here and there or fight like B words like, <laughs> like Donna Morton wrote and then quickly deleted. Uh, yeah, that does happen, right? For the most part, there is sort of a, an unspoken bond among women in poker that they, if, if I don't win, I hope you do, that sort of thing, right? And we see this in comedy too. All the women tend to support each other. And I think that's a good thing. You know, I know that most of the listeners to this podcast are men, and I want to encourage you, if there is a beautiful woman at your table, you know, try not to stare at her. Don't ask her if she's single. Don't try to exploit the fact that she's in the minority and use that against her. Make her feel welcome, but treat her as you would anyone else. You know, I always say when I'm putting a comedy show together, I don't think in terms of well, you know, I want to make sure that we don't have too many male comedians or too many female comedians. To me, I try to treat everyone as equals. And to me, that means there are comedians. Some are black, some are white, some are male, some are female, some are trans, some are tall, some are old, some are young. So that's what I think. I'm very careful not to make the women feel uncomfortable at the table, but I'm also careful not to patronize them. Like, don't go out of your way to say, nice hand, miss, every time she wins a pot, if you're not also doing that for your other seven opponents who are all men. So <laughs> that's kind of my, my take on that. And I've written a lot about this over the years. I'm sure some of you are familiar with a piece that I wrote for 2 Plus 2 magazine many years ago, which was probably the first time anyone in poker had really ever heard of me. But let's get back to this interview. Ebony was trying to suggest or not suggest, but demand that Joey should delete some of the more mean-spirited comments, the part that I'll never read, put it that way. Um, so while that was all going on, uh, Joey brought up that his personal decision as a YouTuber is that he doesn't censor the chat. Now look, I am in favor of free speech. I don't believe in censoring speech uh, just because I disagree with something, that doesn't mean I want it scrubbed from the internet. But where I think I would draw the line is hate speech. And I think that some of what was going on would qualify as hate speech, especially some of the things about Ebony's race. I believe that she is uh, half black. And so some of the comments were kind of pressing that particular button. And I do think the moderators should have stopped it. And I think that people should be able to say, well, I don't like her. 
I think she's a B word. <laughs> uh, I think she's just a clout chaser or whatever. Whatever you want to say about people, I think people should be allowed to say how they feel. But I think you cross the line when you start attacking somebody on the basis of race, religion, color, creed, all the protections that we have in our constitution of these United States. I do think someone should be watching and protecting the guest from that sort of harmful language. Now, since then, Joey has been going out of his way to try to make things right. I mean, I think by now, those of you who are familiar with him, you know he's a fairly emotional guy. And I think that he feels bad about the fact that Ebony ended the interview early. She said, well, then this interview is over. And it was pretty awkward. All right, so that's what happened there. I love Ebony Kenny. I think she's great for the game. I think she's great for the planet. Um, nobody is perfect, but I, for one, am celebrating her success. I think that ACR made a great move when they decided to bring her on as a brand ambassador. And I want to know what you guys think. You can tweet me at Clayton Comic. Please do so publicly. I want to hear all the opposing views as well as thumbs up that I might be receiving for my take on this whole saga. All right, before we get to the strategy hand of the week, I want to talk about something that happened at the Venetian Hotel and Casino in fabulous Las Vegas, the Poker Go Stairway to Millions, part of the Poker Go Tour, a series of 12 different, mostly higher buy-in events, the final two of which were the $25,000 buy-in with a 500K guarantee and a 50K with a 600K guarantee. Well, the numbers for the final two events here were low and the Venetian decided to pull the plug on those events. Now, to be clear, this was not Poker Go's decision. It was not the people who run the PGT Poker Go Tour. The Venetian was afraid of losing money on these events and they decided that instead of having to pony up the difference to cover the guarantee in terms of overlay, they chose to just cancel the two tournaments with the two biggest guarantees of the series. Now, this is a terrible look, obviously, for a Venetian. I mean, look, you have a beautiful property. Uh, your poker room is fine. It's very comfortable. You have a questionable reputation in poker already as your late former owner, Sheldon Adelstein, was always openly and vehemently opposed to online poker in all of its forms. And some think that his lobbying was what caused Black Friday in the first place under the Bush administration. So basically what, what happened here is the Venetian gets another black eye or a black mark on the record by canceling half the guarantees. <laughs> I mean, the two biggest ones, they canceled 1.1 million of guarantees. The whole 12 tournament festival only had 2.15 million overall guaranteed. So, uh, and what makes things even worse, this decision came down less than 20 hours before one of these tournaments started and less than 48 hours before the other. So what a disaster. But you know what, guys? I have a solution for this, and it has to do with government. Look, part of what players say they want all the time is for the government to regulate poker, take out taxes from the winners, make all kinds of laws in terms of fairness and game integrity and things of that nature. Why don't we make a new regulation that says a casino is not allowed to use the word guaranteed and then take it away. Okay, maybe you could have an exception for if there's another coronavirus or if the place catches on fire, okay? But this is just like, look, we see that we're not going to hit our mark here, so we might as well cancel the whole thing. At least have a rule that states they need to give 72 hours notice. Uh, or just don't use the word guaranteed. I remember in the old days... At the Borgata, they never used to do guarantees. They would just say anticipated prize pool or expected prize pool. Or they would list a million dollars for first place in this upcoming tournament. And then with an asterisk, if you read the fine print, it would say based on 2,000 entries. Not guaranteeing that amount, but just kind of giving you an idea of how big they expected or maybe in some cases hoped 
that tournament would be. I think once you start using the word guarantee, you have to pay. You guaranteed it. What does guaranteed even mean? So that's what I would like to see. I don't know whether that will ever happen, especially here in America, where, as we know, the politicians are so indebted to the multi-billion dollar companies who operate most of the casinos in places like Las Vegas. But that's my pipe dream, that they would do something good for the players and just say, look, you can't use that word. That's the G word. Guaranteed means guaranteed. I played in a tournament once in Maryland where I believe it was at Maryland Live. It might have been at the Horseshoe, but they weren't going to meet their guarantee. So what they did is they gave free tickets to the tournament. <laughs> they they bought their VIPs in. All the whales that were in the casino got to come and play. And they were telling me at the table, like, I don't know. Uh, I didn't know anything about this, but I was playing a slot machine, $100 a pool. And my host came over and asked me if I wanted to play in this tournament. So that's that's one way to do it. You know, if you have to pay the money anyway, you might as well use it to take care of your whales or whatever. But look, I think once it's guaranteed, it should happen. And I really feel bad for anyone who made travel arrangements to be in Vegas for that $50,000 buy-in, $600,000 guaranteed tournament as part of the Poker Go Tour. Came to find out as the plane landed that the game was off. All right, so that's enough hot topics for this week. I know you guys want to get to strategy, and I actually was playing this week on America's Card Room, the aforementioned ACR. Uh, I played in something called the Long Car Special. It's an $88 buy-in with a $40,000 guarantee. I believe they run this tournament each and every day on ACR. They get quite a few players, obviously, to meet that guarantee, which they don't often do, but to ACR's credit, they don't cancel the tournament when not that many players buy in. So there is quite often an overlay. Uh, At the same time as I was playing this, I noticed it was Tuesday, which means that I wanted to buy in to the home game of Derek Killingbird Tenbush, who has a fun home game every Tuesday night streamed live on twitch.tv slash killingbird. So I joined the party and luck boxed my way into a first place victory in the $3 buy-in <laughs> killingbird home game, which I later joked on Twitter is the biggest accomplishment of my poker career. But at the same time, I was playing in the long car special. I don't know if I'm saying the guy's name right. He has a $88 buy-in tournament and I was crushing it. This tournament, you start with 20,000 in chips. I had 66,000 by the time the average stack was 28,000. So I was running like God. I outflopped. I, I got it all in when I did have a short stack early on. I got all in with sevens versus kings and flopped a seven to stay alive in the tournament. And after that, it felt like I couldn't lose no matter what I did. Uh, So this is kind of late in the game. We are in the money and the stack is above average at 155K. The average at the time was around 100K. So our M at this point was 18. We had about 45 big blinds. Speaking of the blinds, they are 1750, 3500 with a 450 ante per person so the pot is just under 9k to start and we have 155k in our stack the action folded to me on the button with the ace of diamonds 10 of clubs so ace 10 offsuit on the button action folds to us obviously we're going to open but let's talk about the blinds just so we can kind of start to plan ahead for the hand The small blind has me covered with about 162,000 in his stack. He's just got a few more chips than we do, and he's the only bigger stack at the table. He's also extremely loose aggressive. He's running 28-25 with an 11% three bet percentage. So that's really high, Uh, and I'm fully expecting him to at least sometimes play back at me when I open the button, as I'm going to do here. Uh, the big blind is a decent pro, 19-11, uh, with about an 8% 3-bet 
and a 6.0 PFA, that's post-flop aggression factor. So let's talk about this. These are HUD statistics we're going through now. A six is super high. What it means is his ratio, now I have over 500 hands on this player, his ratio of bets and raises post-flop to checks and calls is six to one. That's really high. I mean, most pros are like right around two. And that's a really, I mean, that's true. He's betting and raising three times more often than most pros would be. So I know that this big blind is going to be an extremely aggressive player after the flop. That's important. He's got 56,000 in his stack. So we've got him obviously well covered. We open to 7K, just a min raise here. And only the big blind, the player I just described, calls. So now there is 20,000 in the middle and the effective stack is the villain with 52,000, the big blind. The flop comes king, king, four, rainbow. Again, hero holding the ace, 10 offsuit. So king, king, four, and opponent checks. I don't think there's any problem with betting small here as a C-bet. You got to get a little protection when the opponent has two unpaired cards. But against a player that's this aggressive, I don't really want to bet and get check raised off of what is pretty likely to be the better hand in this situation. I mean, Ace-10 is good on this flop so often, but I don't really want to play a huge pot with it. So I decide to go ahead and check it back. So now there's still 20K in the middle and the turn comes the 10 of hearts. It gives us a pair. How about that? So now the board is king, king, four, ten, Badugi, hero with the ace, ten offsuit, and again, villain checks. This time I decide to bet really small. I'm trying to get value from a gut shot or maybe just a curious ace high. So I bet 4,000 into the 20,000 pot, and my opponent calls after a little bit of a tank. Now there's 28,000 in there and Villain still has almost twice the pot in his stack at 48,000 or so. And the river comes the 10 of diamonds for a final board of king, king, four, 10, 10. So we've got a full house, tens full of kings and our opponent donk shoves the whole 48,000 right into the 28,000 pot. What in the world am I supposed to do with this? I mean, look, he's about as polarized as you can get. He's saying, I have a king, right? He's trying to tell me I have a king. I don't think he should make this bet with a 10. I don't think he should make this bet with any hand besides a king. I just kept looking. I really wanted to fold, but I just kept looking at that 6.0 post-flop aggression factor uh, and this huge over bet, you know, doesn't he want to try to get value? But that's dangerous line of thinking. I mean, he's saying I have it. It's just a question of, do we believe him? So I'm really supposed to fold, but my hand is a little too strong. And I, I remember thinking to myself, well, if I don't call with a 10, then what am I calling with? It's too exploitable. You know what, guys? Some of these GTO ideas that we have end up getting us into trouble because it doesn't matter if you're exploitable, if your opponent's never going to exploit you. And I know that's hard to know who can exploit me and who can't. I know that. I should just say, you know what? If you're bluffing, good for you, bro. Good for you. (laughs) You win the pot because I can't just call and hope that it's a 10 for a chop or some weird bluff because it just won't be often enough, which is what makes the big overbet shove such an effective move but yeah you know i can't fold this i called and sure enough he showed king seven and at that point my stack dipped to slightly below average i have another hand uh from the same tournament remember guys we're already in the money uh you know the low payouts it's an 88 dollars buy-in i think at this point there were still like 100 players left in the thing so the payout was something like $170 or something like that. The big money up top was almost 9000 So I'm not getting too excited 
about laddering up just yet. I'm trying to make that final table. A little while later, we're at the very same table and the new blinds are 2,000, 4,000 with a 500 ante. So the pot is 10,000 to start. But because of the other hand, we now only have 94,000 in our stack. Our M is 9.4. We have about 23 big blinds. At this point, the average is almost 110. So we're just below the average stack, but still fine. We don't have to just try to find a hand to push and pray or whatever. Here the action folds to me in the cutoff with the ace of hearts, six of hearts. Now I know that in the last hand I was on the button and in this hand I'm in the cutoff, but let me emphasize this was not right away. This was some time after the previous hand. Now I already described the two players on my left, the button and the small blind, were the small blind and big blind from the previous hand we just went over. But I need to talk to you guys about the big blind in this hand. He's loose aggressive. He's been three betting quite a bit. Uh, I don't have a ton of hands on him, but it's pretty clear between his HUD stats and the way he's been playing that he is not one to just take things lying down. So we have the ace six suited and we open to 8,000 from the cutoff. I'm willing to get all in if the big blind three bets. He's got a lot of chips. He's got 180,000, twice what we have. And he's shown a propensity to attack at every turn. So I was willing to four bet shove. I was hoping he would three bet because I think a six suited is a great shove with 23 big blinds against a player like this. But he just called my bet. And at that point, I realized I had made a mistake in my sizing pre-flop because there was 22,000 in the middle and the effective stack is my stack, which is 86,000. I hate to have an SPR of between three and five. It is just really hard to play without putting yourself in awkward situations with that type of SPR. And this was the most likely outcome was that the big blind would call. So I could have created a better SPR for myself if I would have opened to more like 3x. And then I could really play with SPR below 3. It's pretty easy. You flop an ace, you never fold. Or you try to get all in when you flop a flush draw with this hand. So I think I should have made it like eleven or 12,000. But instead, we're now here with this awkward stack to pot ratio. And the flop comes. Jack of spades, 10 of hearts, 8 of spades. And the big blind checks. And before I tell you what I did here on the flop, I just want to talk very quickly about this company that I'm so happy to call a sponsor of this podcast, SitesOptimized.com. That's plural, S-I-T-E-S, Optimized.com. A web design and SEO company uh, started by my friend Danny that I met over the summer in the World Series of Poker. I actually got to play some poker with him. Really nice guy. He's one of us. He's a podcast listener. He heard me talking about needing sponsors for the podcast with all the changes at TPE, and he stepped up to the plate. So if you have a business and you need a website or you'd like to redesign your website or you feel like your website isn't turning visitors into customers or callers, or anything good for you, you should really get in touch with Danny at sitesoptimized.com. Prices started only $299 for a website and $195 a month for SEO services. Now this means like when somebody searches for a service that you offer or a product that you sell, your site appears closer to the top of the list that the search engine Google or whatever pops out. So this is really important. You want them to see your site for your business so that they click on you instead of the competition. You can get a free mock-up design of your homepage just by mentioning that you're a TPE podcast listener. So for more information, visit sitesoptimized.com and tell Danny that you and he have the TPE podcast in common. All right, so let's review. Where are we? 
We're on the flop here. I opened before the flop with ace of hearts, six of hearts, got called by a loose aggressive player in the big blind and saw a flop of jack of spades, 10 of hearts, eight of spades. So the big blind checks. Now you can bet this if you want. I personally feel like against this player profile, I want to check this flop because I don't have enough equity to continue if I get check raised. And I think that there are so many draws available on Jack 10, eight with two spades that, you know, any nine is going to check raise me a lot. Uh, any King, Queen, Queen, nine, nine, seven, you know, any gut shot. I feel like he's going to be check raising this flop so often. And against that check raise, particularly with my ugly SPR, I just need to fold. So I don't want to put myself in that situation. I'm just going to check behind here and see what happens on 4th Street. I'm thinking to myself, come on, heart, so that we have a good card with which to continue. And there's still 22,000 in the middle. When the turn comes, the queen of spades. So our board is now jack, 10, 8, queen with three spades, hero holding the ace, six of hearts. And the big blind checks once again. Now I think we need to take a stab at this pot. We have ace king in our range. We have straights in our range. It's unlikely that this opponent would have checked twice if he had a nine. So I'm going to do something I usually don't recommend, which is bluffing a loose aggressive opponent, <laughs> which is already dicey. Bluffing any loose opponent is dicey at best when I don't really have a significant blocker. Yes, I have an ace. So it's less likely that my opponent has ace-king, but he never has ace-king here anyway. He would have tried to get all in with me pre-flop if he did. So the ace is rather insignificant. So I don't really have a significant blocker. And the fact that there are three spades out there and I don't have one makes it a little more likely that my opponent has a flush or a strong flush draw. However, I do feel that this opponent would have led on the turn if he had a nine or a good spade or two pair or a lot of hands. So the fact that he has now checked it twice was enough for me to go ahead and bet. I put in 7,000 into the 22,000 pot. And just to punish me for everything I've ever done wrong in my life, the big blind raises to 18,000. So you're thinking, why are we talking about this hand, Clayton? Obviously, we can't continue. Oh, is this your first time listening? I am going to exploit this player's natural tendency to bluff too often and with too many hands. And I made it 31,000, put it right back on him, knowing fully well I could be drawing completely dead. I left myself with just over 50,000 behind. And I was saying out loud, something you can't ever do in live poker is say what you want your opponent to do out loud. <laughs> I was like, come on, please fold, please fold, please fold. And sure enough, he did. So that was the hand that put me right back on track in this tournament. Now, yeah, that was a fun one, but still nothing compares to the thrill of winning the $3 buy-in Killing Bird home game. I'll never forget. It actually brings a, a little tear to the eye just just thinking about how good that felt to take that one down. All right, that's going to do it for this episode, guys. Definitely subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done so already. If you have the opportunity to leave a good rating, uh, a five-star rating or review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you guys know by now how much that means to us. It really helps us in terms of SEO. And speaking of SEO, do check out sitesoptimized.com for all of your web design and SEO needs. So for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. I wanna hold them like they do in Texas plays. Hold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart.
Yeah. 